Oh, oh, is that the problem? Didn't even occur to me to switch on the microphone. I, I guess I didn't need, I didn't realize it wasn't sounding in the room. Um, so it sounds better now, even out in the room. Oh, all right. So now I assuming Meat Echo can hear me now. And they couldn't hear me before. Antoine, you want to step into the room and say hi? Uh, and just confirm for us that the Meat Echo is working? Oh, okay. Excellent. And I went off again. I have to uh, watch that. Um, what I really should do is take a moment to... Yeah. Where is the, um, shoot, well, I guess it'll stay on, okay. There he is, Antoine, thank you. We see you. I had a bit of a problem with the audio as well when the video was leaving. I'm here now. Okay, thank you. That was a little muffled, but I think I got that. So that's good. Yeah. Um, we're just waiting just another minute or two here um, for our uh, notes taker to um, be, be set up and ready to go. Okay. All right. So this is registration protocols extensions. Uh, thank you everyone once again for uh, making it to our, our meeting here. Um, and uh, we have uh, Antoine uh, remotely, um, my uh, esteemed co-chair here. And uh, we have your, your big head floating in the room, so that's great. Um, and, okay, uh, the usual note well. Um, so uh, if anybody has any questions or whatever about this, uh, encourage you to talk to your own lawyer and then come back and tell us what you decided. Uh, but in any case, uh, the ITF owns you. That's the only thing you need to know. That's, the right. That's right. You have the right to remain silent. That's what's important. And not fill out the blue sheets. Oh, and, and speaking of blue sheets, I can't, they're not even, oh, hey. well, that was my one flaw in this process, was so not getting the blue sheets ready. I'll do that in a, in a moment. This is just a, a standard slide that we put up here about document reviews. I mean, we have the same problem. Other groups have this problem. You know, I mean, uh, I, I think that you're sensitive, more sensitive to it when you're a document author, you know. But, you know, obviously, if you want people to review your document, you should be willing to review theirs. And I think it's a good exercise for people anyway to review documents. I mean, it's important to the, to the progress of the standards, and, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Okay, moving on to welcome and introductions. So, um, we have a Jabber scribe and a note scribe, and i uh, already introduced myself and Antoine, so that's good. So let's jump to uh, talking about our existing document status. Um, very quickly, the uh, launch phase document. We'll, we'll talk a little more about the launch phase here when we get to talking about the, uh, the fee document. We had submitted this document to the ISG for publication. Um, and uh, Adam does have it, and, and it turns out that what it's waiting for, it hasn't moved to the IESG agenda in particular, um, because uh, he conducts a review before he advances the document. 
Um, so that's actually in progress, and he has some comments he's going to, in questions, he'll be bringing back to the working group um, shortly after we get out of this meeting. Uh, but it also turns out that as a result of the fee document intermeeting meeting that we had, we had some suggestions for uh, this particular document. So we'll get to that discussion later. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, yay for us for uh, submitting a document for publication, um, but we'll just have to deal with sort of some minor uh, last-minute issues here as we go along. So uh, the next item on the agenda is to talk about the fee extension document and the interim meeting that we had with respect to that document. And Roger, we will go over to you. You can come up here to the microphone and stand in the pink box so the Meet Echo folks can see you. And while you talk, I'm going to distribute the blue sheets. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the fee document is is there. Uh, we've got a, one last big item to solve. Uh, I don't know if it's big or not, but one last item to solve, um, and that deals with the launch phase um, and how we portray launch phase depending on what the client sends in. So originally, uh, version 5 draft said if uh, no launch phase was passed in, server would respond with um, I think on version five, it would respond with all active launch phases. Um, and in our interim meeting, which we had, Jim, last week, I believe, um, we had eight people participate. Um, it was great, uh, great turnout. We actually discussed the launch phase piece for probably about 45 minutes straight, uh, going back on the pros and cons of each of uh, the possibilities. And uh, we spent an hour. Um, just on a virtual meeting and uh, me coming out of it I thought it was great we actually got to an end spot where we think this last piece and we can actually push this draft final draft through and get a working group last call on it soon so um, I again the fee document piece the last remaining question and I think it's um, section uh, three point something um, three eight three eight um, it deals with the launch phase and it's just the outstanding questions, I posted it to the list last week. Um, I don't think there's been a whole lot of discussion yet on it. Uh, I know Jody posted something yesterday uh, or this morning, something about on it, um, laying out the four possible scenarios. Uh, if, the server, or if the client doesn't pass anything, server returns an error. It's uh, something that I don't think the group really thought should be done. Um, the other option was if the client does not pass anything, the server returns the current phase. Uh, the problem came in is if there's more than two phases or more than one phase active currently, what happens? Um, so that was an outstanding question. Do you then return an error because you can't decide or do you pass back those number of phases back, which then starts to get a little more verbose that some people didn't really want to get into. Um, I don't know if there was a third option or not. Oh, just so it was passing back all active phases, and then they got discussion around what an active phase was, you know, came about. And it's is is anything current? Everybody kind of agreed on, but the discussion was if there's a future phase, would that be considered active or not? So that was one of the discussions, um, and I think that I, I don't think there's enough consensus on it. Um, I think if we can get launch phase updated to provide the listing functionality, I think that uh, the current should be just the current and not future, is my opinion. Questions? Jim? This is Jim Gold from Verisign. Uh, so yeah, I, I looked at the the, the notes from the interim meeting, and I re-reviewed the the section in the launch phase extension because I could, honestly could not remember multiple active phases. So um, I looked at it, and it does have text in there associated with supporting simultaneous or uh, sequential uh, phases. So I believe that was feedback from the list a while back to be able to support multiple active phases. Um, I don't have a specific use case for mm -hmm. that scenario. Um, it would be good to know. 
uh, whether or not there is a valid use case for simultaneous active. But my interpretation of active would be current, not future. Yeah. And um, I don't I don't believe that this would be a big deal if that's a corner case. If multiple active is truly a corner case, then returning back multiple active uh, fees in the response, I think, is an acceptable uh, solution. But uh, I, I believe it's a corner case. So. And, and I agree, Jim. And I think that if we can get launch phase updated to provide the list, then it, it, it could dictate the registrar what's actually to pass in the correct things and not an empty field or something. So Yeah, let me address the, the listing <laughs> item. Uh, I don't believe a listing would work in launch phase or in the fee. Uh, because both of those are command response extensions. They're not object extensions. Uh, this is better suited for if you're going to provide metadata about a policy or uh, policies or features of the TLD, then do something similar to what VeriSign has done in our proprietary registry mapping extension, which when you're querying for information, it's going to come back and says, here are the phases. If they're overlapping, so be it. Um, but that's not really what the launch phase extension is set up for since it's an extension of domain so it doesn't doesn't really work okay i don't i want to gloss over that too too lightly though that's actually a very significant point and and those who were part of the fee extension interim meeting that we had i know i, I really need to know what other people think and what you want to do about this issue you know from my point of view james is basically saying that our the suggestion out of that group to put the, the functionality into the launch phase document, that's not the right place to do it. It needs to go someplace else. This matters because the fee extension document depends on this functionality. And so, you know, it just then becomes a, um, a dependency on the part of the fee extension document. So uh, if folks have a comment about that and, and what you want to do, we would like to hear that, please. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Alex? Uh, Alex Mayer for Nick.at. AT. Um, my concern with, with that launch stage usage and the way it's being used, um, I understand by a single implementation is that they are using it in a way uh, for which we actually envision the class to be yeah, used. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether a more favorable class would actually to ask the implementer, the one implementer who uses it in that way, why he actually can't use the classes instead of that. Yeah, and. Regarding the, my general point about the fee extension, my requirement to the change to the document is that the fee extension must work on a registry that is completely unaware of launch phases. Yeah, We might have cases out there and we are running a CCTLD registry as well and we don't have any launch phases there. If we ever decide to do premium names or something like that, we want to use the fee extension, but we're not going to introduce launch phases just because of the fee extension. So that's my base requirement. Yeah. However we get there, I don't have a super strong opinion. I'm just worried about bending the standard because the implementation choice of a single implementation. Yeah, and that's what I also said at the interim meeting. So before you walk away, just to make sure I understand, I mean, as it as it is now, we do meet your requirements, right? So is, I mean, is there a change that you're nervous of that, because I, the I think the document says I should list all the available phases. Yeah, a registry that is completely unaware of the launch phases, would it be fine if it returned an empty set of elements? Yeah. If that's okay, fair enough. Yeah. So you're I'm talking still about worried the feature about that, that tight connection between one extension and the other extension, because as you know, as soon as you put two things together, it typically doesn't get sync one. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, what I recall from the intra meeting discussion is, is you you thought well of you 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 did want to move that particular functionality out of the P document, right? The the idea of returning all the valid launch phases, and and right now it currently works so that if you don't give a launch phase, you you do get a response. Yeah. And I think all of that meets your requirements. And so, other than that, you're yeah. okay. okay. I just want to avoid um, the misuse of the launch phases for. For, for an application use case for which the class attribute was actually intended for. Yeah. And I understand we also had different prices during Sunrise and blah, 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 of course. Um, but like introducing 100 uh, launch phases just because we have 100 price classes um, is not the right thing if you have the class attribute available as well. 
But yeah. thanks, Alex. Uh, finally, uh, um, don't get me wrong. I want to get this done, so I hope we can uh, <laughs> submit it to publication before yeah. um, Singapore. We will. Jody. Uh, Jody Culker, GoDaddy. So one of, one of the questions that I had is at at times during a registry's launches, there are uh, no um, there's no phase available. For instance, there could be a quiet period between sunrise and land rush, land rush and GA, or any of the other phases that you could have. So during that time, I guess what what I'd like to try to figure out is what gets returned if no launch phase is sent in while there is no phase available. Is is nothing available to be registered then? That kind of thing. This is Jim Gold from VeriSign. Um, I would say no. If there's a gap between the two um, and that you're not accepting registrations at that point, then the fee would not come back with anything because you can't register at that point. But then if obviously it rolled into, let's say, land rush or claims, then it would return back the appropriate fee. But if the registrar wanted to know what the fee was for the future phase, then they can obviously ask for it. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, when you're in a quiet period, the registrar has to send in a fee if they want to know what it is, or, or the phase, I'm sorry. Hey, Jim, uh, will that come back unavailable? Oh, the domain name? That's good, a good question. We don't, have, we don't have those gaps in our systems, um, so I'd like to hear from one of the other registries that may have a gap. Uh, my assumption is it would come back as unavailable, because otherwise it will then fail on the create. If, it, if there's not an active phase, so. Anyone have thoughts on that? During a quiet period, uh, a check will come back unavailable. All checks will, unless the phase has been identified. So, uh, Jim Galvin, and just to clarify, make sure that I understand this, um, I'm just remembering a discussion that we had before. Yeah, what, what you're saying is that um, if the phase is not active, then it's not available. If, it, if, if, a, if a create command will not succeed, then it has to be indicated as unavailable. That's the way that this extension will work. If a create command would fail, then it shouldn't show up here as available. I think that's actually a, a question independent of this extension. So take away the fee extension, and you don't have an active phase, and a registrar asks whether or not a domain is available. Are you going to return back true that's available? You could, but then the create will fail, right? Right. And honestly, I, again, I you know our registries do not have this gap period, so if there is a registry that does have a gap period, it'd be great to hear from that registry. Hello, Chris from uh, Core Association. Uh, I have seen both some registries uh, return unavailable, some return available, and then when you do the create, there's nothing there. It doesn't work. So I, I don't know if that's, if that's within the scope of what we're trying to do with this extension, though, because that's up to the registry to decide what they're going to return in availability. And can we force them with this extension to do something else? I, I, would, I would assume no. We could provide guidance, uh, Jim Calvin speaking. Um, I mean, obviously we, we could, I mean, I don't know that, I guess the question is whether it should be a must or a should. I think my going in position would be it should be a should, you know, that the way you should behave um, if someone asks for a price, is whether or not you say it's available or unavailable um, should depend on whether a create would succeed or fail. And we could make an indication that way. I mean, as a registrar, you know, what would you prefer? I mean, this is also, I mean, as James said, there's, there's partly this, uh, what do other registries do in a gap condition? Um, what would registrars like to see? Um, I think, I think, it should be available. It should show as available, but it should have some caveat, maybe in a region field, something that the launch phase is not active right now. 
or something like that. Because the domain, saying it's unavailable could mean that the domain is registered already. So how can we tell the customer why this domain name is not available? So we need both the availability and the reason behind the unavailability. Scott Holland back. I'm going to disagree slightly, and I'm going to go back to the core specs to explain why. The purpose of a check command is to give you a hint as to whether or not a, a, a create command will succeed or fail, right? And, you know, modulo anything that happens in between the execution of the, of the check and the create, right? So if you return available in response to a check, and then you fail a create, right, and, and not because the domain got registered in the interim, I think that is misleading and is counter to the very specific text that is in the core part of the specs right now. So I hear you arguing on behalf of um, what we should say in the spec here is, um, yeah, we should tie it to, to the create command. We should actually say, you should only say available if a create command would succeed. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's other reasons for a create to fail, so we have to be specific about that it's because of a quiet sure. period or whatever, but yeah, I think that makes sense. So I'll have to find the, the right and type. I, I think to answer Chris's question, I, I think that if we did do that, we could pass a reason back in the fee check or the fee extension piece that says reason and it's a quiet period or whatever. This is this is always from IS. Um, I think we should uh, tie it to the original check command because, I mean, that is what we're going for, right? We are sending a check. Uh, and so the semantics should follow the, you know, the original. So like Scott pointed out, the, or the, the check should return available if a create command would succeed and it should return unavailable if it won't succeed. So and that is what we should use here too. If we shouldn't, you know, this extension shouldn't change the behavior and it shouldn't define the behavior at all. It should just say, we use the original behavior. And that is what we're going to, to, to use in this extension. So I guess I just want to, Jody Kalker from GoDaddy. Um, I, I just want to wrap this up a little bit. So basically, if what we pass in in the check command is going to be used to create the domain name, that's how we're going to determine whether it's available or not. So you, you have to have the correct phases on it, um, all the correct extensions on it in order to do the check command to return whether it's available or not, because those, those same extensions will be passed in with the create command. Yes, Jim Gold from VeriSign. I, I say no, uh, just because uh, there are different set of extensions that may be applicable only to the create. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make as a precondition having to pass extra extensions on the check for the check to effectively work as defined in the core. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. But it, it, but you at least need some extensions for some of these. You need to have the fee extension on it, right? And, and the launch phase to create for some of these. Oh, hang on. I, I'm sure that there's registries that have needed the launch phase on there in order to register the domain. Uh, this Jim Gold again. Uh, yeah, no, you don't need the launch phase extension specifically. But for one thing, uh, you're providing the capability of including the phases in the fee extension, so it's self contained. Yes. You mean including the phases. Okay. Got <laughs> oh yeah. No, I would. I would suggest that. I would suggest that. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, if the the phase is not passed, then based on what you've defined in 3.8 of uh, the fee extension, I honestly don't have much of an issue with that as long as we understood what multiple active phases meant, right? right? And then if a future phase or a, a, in essence a future phase was desired then the, the registrar could go ahead and provide that. 
Oh, but that was about availability, though, right? So the availability was that, yeah, if uh, if the uh, the current phase is a gap, then in essence, the availability in the app for the domain itself should be unavailable, and then the fee should be unavailable. Right. And I, I agree with the point made previously. Okay. okay. So I think in trying to bring this to a close, um, there there are still two. I think you understand what has to happen here with all of this, right? Yep. So we're, we're good at that. You're going to provide some revised text. Yes. Question that I have though is, did do you believe that you've heard consensus on what to do with the the launch phase stuff? Because I heard James saying it shouldn't go into the launch phase document um, as document editor here or uh, of this document. Um, what are you suggesting for the working group to consider it for taking that uh, particular issue forward? Yeah, I, I think that we still have to decide on that piece of where is that going to come from because I. I think that's functionality that's still needed, um, and people don't want to provide it in the fee, which doesn't seem like it should be. And as Jim suggested, it doesn't seem like it fits us in the launch phase. So where are we going to put that piece? And I'll let uh, James speak a little bit to that, but I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on and take it to the list too. But please go ahead. Yeah, again, I, I believe it's a corner case for multiple active phases. So I'd really like to hear a specific use of that. So in essence, saying that it's needed, I, I guess I'm not sure if I'm in agreement that it's needed because it sounds like a corner case. And then if we're going to go down that path of providing information around phases, then we should think of it more generically, not just about phases, but uh, features and policies as well. Well, yeah, and I can give you the case is when you do a pre-registration, you pre-register for multiple phases and you need to know what those phases are. That are coming up so that you can pre-reg for them because you may pre-reg for sunrise or you may pre-reg for ga but if you don't know what those phases are how are you going to pre-reg for those well in that scenario you're talking about future phases yes so that doesn't match the use case of multiple active phases so that's a different use case no the use case of providing a list of phases that the registry has oh, oh but that's that's even different, right? So now if you're talking about the case of multiple active to support the fee extension, yes. now we're talking about all the phases. Yes, that, and, I, and my my, no. lit, my email to the list mentions both of those okay, great. scenarios. Like I said, if it's more encompassing that we might want to make a more generic extension provide not just phases, mm -hmm. but other information as well, similar to what VeriSign has already created in our proprietary registry mapping extension. Okay. Take a look at it. Um, I think I've already posted a list. I'll post it to the list again. Take a look at it and see whether or not that kind of information, which includes all the phases, by the way, would be applicable. So to your point, I will post to the list that separate question, hold out of this so that we can separate the items and move forward. And you could also post a uh, revised document with what we have now so yep. that we can look at those differences. And then when this closes, there'll be one more revision, and then we can submit it for yes. publication. So OK. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I'm in favor of interim meetings again, just in case no one got that. I think they work well, and we're probably going to have more, hopefully. Um, There's and, a spot on the end of the agenda to talk about interim meetings. Okay. And I think we should have multiple meetings here like we did in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With Oh, uh, he's going to post a revised document with uh, at least the consensus that came out of the interim meeting uh, and the little bit of discussion that we just had here. Um, and then the second thing is he will post as a separate question to the list how to deal with the feature of um, being able to find out and discover all the launch phases, all the phases that are available for a given domain name. Okay. <coughs> Next up, um, Lin Lin to um, talk about uh, at the uh, organization extension document. These were, these were previously the uh, reseller documents, if you recall, and we had quite a bit of discussion about this in, in our last session about generalizing this object to rather than being a reseller explicitly, let's just make it an organization object. Um, and uh, so she's here going to tell us about the changes that she made as, as part of uh, moving in that direction. And so we have your slides here. And, yeah. and I will just say next slide or look at me and I'll move them along for you. Okay. 
Um, hello everyone, uh, and today I will give a very quick update on the uh, organization uh, extension drafts. Uh, actually, we have discussed uh, reseller drafts for many times, and uh, we, uh, the working group, and also had many opinions about the reseller direction. You know, we had the uh, uh, four up listed four op options at a uh, so. ITF meeting, uh, I think, and uh, finally the working group decided to uh, do a new object, uh, organization object, and uh, it will have uh, many different type of roles, uh, including uh, registrar, registry, and uh, reseller, um, and many uh, other type of roles uh, the, the the registry defined, and uh, so. Uh, all of the co-authors of this draft um, had discussed many times, and uh, we did uh, spend some time to update uh, the uh, reseller drafts to the current organization draft. And uh, um, this so, Lin Lin, just the same slide is down in, in front of you, uh, so you don't have to turn around. You can speak okay. into the mic. <laughs> I didn't see it. Okay, for uh, for the organization extension draft. Uh, the modification is uh, relatively simple because uh, the, there is only one element ID uh, in the extension part and uh, uh, we uh, add an attribute uh, with the ID element, uh, the row uh, attribute that uh, represents the uh, relationship. Uh, an organization would have. And the values are defined in a row value registries uh, and uh, you can update uh, all the values. And next. Uh, this is uh, in the slide, there is a, a simple info response example and uh, uh, the, the ID will have a list of row, row, rows uh, such as the reseller, privacy, ox, uh, Privacy proxy. And next, please. And for the organization extension dropped, and we have some new elements, uh, including the ID, status, and uh, uh, organization row elements with two sub elements. And one is a, a type, and it also has a row status attribute, and the other. Uh, sub element is the optional row ID. This row ID element is defined to uh, uh, to have a third party assigned ID such as the INA ID for a registrar. And this uh, is an optional choice. And the, the following is an example of the row element. And next, please. Uh, this part, this slide is about the row value that I mentioned before. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, we have some initial values uh, defined in this registry. We, uh, we list uh, the registrar, reseller, and the privacy proxy. And also you have your own values. You could uh, uh, give us feedback and we can update this part. Next, please. And, um, when we put in for vote, uh, the the reseller drops, we also we have many uh, comments and feedbacks on the mailing list, and many experts talk to us. And uh, uh, we always heard about why reseller is important than registrar or some other row uh, rows of organizations. So at the time we changed it to to a generic object uh, organization object extension. Um, and uh, we also heard about uh, uh, maybe this extension is a little complicated, and uh, we tried our best to minimize the required uh, fields. There are only seven now, and uh, uh, if for for just uh, one single type of uh, uh, organization, if you just uh, extend the reseller, um, I think you, maybe you can identify. Uh, and reseller from its name, but for many multiple types of organizations, that maybe it's a little difficult for us to just identify uh, a reseller from a name. So I think um, it's it is needs to have a row uh, or organization 
uh, object. And uh, also, this is a new stuff for the organization um, drops. So also need comments and reviews. That's all. Thank you. So an important consideration for the working group is, you know, is this document now in a place where it's uh, ready to move forward or not? Um, and so one question that I have for you, uh, Lynn, is do you have any work in your mind uh, to do on, on these documents now? We kind of had the discussion about generalizing it to organization. Are, are there any open questions in your mind with respect to these documents? Of course, in my mind that uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, working group uh, discussion and uh, many actors have suggested to uh, do a more generic op organization object. So we changed the text and uh, uh, XML uh, formats and uh, to certify all these requirements. And uh, also we have some requirements to uh, extend the result Based on the result, we also have many other road types of organizations. So I think that we'd like to move forward with both terms. Okay. James? Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a statement as well. Um, I, I'm a co-author on this, and we work together to come up with this based on the working group uh, feedback. I think what's needed now is some implementation experience. Uh, uh, and, and my proposal would be for the registries to look potentially use this uh, for the registrar information. So I don't know, uh, it, it's VeriSign's like, for example, created a custom extension for providing who is information to support transfers. This would might be an alternative mechanism uh, for registrars to be able to get information about the other registrar uh, directly in line uh, without going to who is and that sort of thing. Just an idea of getting some experience in using this because um, then uh, the next step would be for reseller information if the registrars uh, want to do that. So. so this might be a good opportunity to uh, just get an indication from folks. I'm assuming that um, it's saying, Nick, folks, that you have implemented this or, or will? Uh, yes, we have. A, uh, actually, before we do the uh, reseller jobs, we already have an implement part of the uh, yes, we have implemented a part of uh, the extension, and so we will do it. Is there, is there anyone else who um, has implemented or will implement? Or I guess maybe just a, a quick show of hands. Anyone want to want to comment? James coming to the microphone. Uh, we have implemented the reseller version, and I intend to update our SDK to support the organization. Uh, and we're going to be looking and discussing currently related to formally supporting it in production. Thank you. Um, Chris from Core Association. Um, we, we intend to implement this extension when when it's in a final finalized state. Okay. Um, well, I, I think what I'm hearing here is, oh, I'm sorry, Scott, go ahead. Uh, it's Scott Hollenbeck. Uh, not that I'm going to say anything counter to what Jim said, but what I would suggest then in terms of moving forward, remember, implementation is not a requirement, right? However, uh, there was a recent RFC, 70 something, 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 that describes an implementation status section that can be added to internet drafts. What I would suggest we do then is add that text, capture everything we know about existing implementations, and move forward from there. Yes, thank you. So I, I, I think, you know, where we are at this point is there clearly is some, some traction. So we have some implementations that are going to happen. And uh, this document is appears to be stable at the moment. Um, and so it's important to move to that step. So I think the status of the document is to bring to the mailing list a, a desire to learn about implementation status and have people report to the list on what they have done or will do um, and uh, capture all of that. And then we can make a decision about uh, when to move forward. Ideally, if we can find at least two people who will put an implementation status in there of actual implementations, um, then I, at least two, then I would say we, we can much more uh, comfortably suggest to move the document forward. Okay. 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 All right. Nothing else then. Thank you. Okay. That's good. Um, next up, we have a uh, new presentation. 
um, uh, a new proposal for a, a document for uh, this group to consider. And I believe Tom is here. Yes, OK. Um, Tom to come up. And uh, this one I have to switch slides for. So please go ahead. Uh, hi. This draft is about um, returning historical records via ADAP, so allowing people to see previous versions of objects and also being able to, to determine how an object appeared at a given point in time. Sorry, next slide. Uh, there are various use cases here. Um, one is transfer recipients, so people wanting to see who held, say, an IP address block throughout its history. Uh, disputants, so when people are in conflict over a resource, um, they'll be able to see whether any suspicious changes have been made to any of the relevant records. There's uh, law enforcement use cases, so being able to see who controlled an IP address block at a given point in time. And then more open-ended, there are research use cases as well. The main element of this draft is a new RDAP object class called History. It contains a list of records where each of the records contains, in turn, an RDAP object and a date period. And the date period defines the time for which that object was current. The date period is half open, so as to allow for easy sequencing of records. Uh, and retrieval of objects is agnostic as to the underlying RDAP object class. So it works for the currently defined object classes as well as any that might come up in the future. So. This is just an example of an object returned from the from this service. Uh, it's an ASN. Uh, yeah, so it shows the date ranges and there's an extra RDAP conformance value as well. Uh, so. IP address ranges are a bit different. Uh, compared with the other object types because they can be split or aggregated over time. So, for example, if somebody queries for a 24, but when they query, the only object that exists is, the, is a covering 22, but previously that more specific 24 existed, there's an argument that maybe only the 24's history should be returned or perhaps the 22, or, yeah. So it's not, rather than try to, I guess, pick one or the other, uh, the draft goes a simple route and just says return everything that covers uh, everything that intersects whenever it existed. Uh, next slide. There are obvious issues with running a historical service over and above a standard registry service. Uh, things like mistaken data entry uh, then being removed, um, historical data that reflects poorly on somebody. Uh, and also people looking at the historical data and misinterpreting its currency. So people going to contact people who used to look after a block or a record and then getting very confused about what's going on. Uh, a couple of options here. RDAP allows for the omitting of data from responses. So for example, PII might be omitted from historical responses. Uh, and also a history service could be, could, could be put behind authentication. And there are a few different options there. Uh, the first link here is to the public history service that APNIC runs at the moment. The second is to the back end for that service. And the third is a rudimentary front end uh, that allows for querying and seeing object diffs over time. Next slide. Uh, we'd very much appreciate any review and feedback. Uh, a couple of open issues are how to handle redirections. So in the numbers space where an IP address block has moved from one registry to another, there's a question about how to best represent that in, in this document. And then we're coming at this very much from a numbers perspective. So if there are, there are probable issues around forward domains that we're not thinking of. So any feedback along those lines would be great as well. Uh, we're not looking for adoption just yet, mainly because we're conscious of the number of milestones that are already in play and the number of documents that are probably looking for that and have already been discussed. So, yeah, just looking to gauge interests. That's it, thanks. Okay. <coughs> Let me just take a moment to uh, remind folks in the working group 
um, there's almost always a, a few new people around. So the registration extensions uh, working group actually serves two roles. Uh, one, of course, is to process any kind of document in the registration extensions area, which applies to both EPP and RDAP, thinks they want to go onto the standards track. Um, so we, we have that role in, in conducting that review um, and adoption and then moving it through the, the formal process for all of that. In addition, uh, this the, the working group and, and the mailing list in particular is open and available for anyone with a related document who is looking for appropriate expertise to get some review. Um, there is an explicit use case for this, which is the IANA registry of EPP extensions. Um, these are not required to be internet standards, so people can certainly create extensions, which they can then simply ask to get listed in that registry, which is always allowed. Um, there is a, a technical review that happens to items that go into that registry, um, mostly just for self-consistency and, and if any conflicts exist. Um, but folks are uh, used, this mailing list, the mailing list for this working group is used as the contact point for uh, people who submit a request to IANA to get on that registry. So they get reviewed by this working group. Scott Hollenbeck actually uh, leads the, the team of people who are responsible for those documents. Um, but in any case, we encourage these kinds of things. So um, I just want to make that clear. He's allowed to come here and say, you know, this is not for adoption yet, but he is looking for some review and, and uh, comments from the expertise in this group. And there's no one jumping up to the mic who seems to want to say something, but um, I, I do, you know, you're encouraged, please, to continue on the mailing list, press on the document, um, and uh, we'll, we'll try to move this forward. And if, if and when you're ready to ask for adoption, we'll, we'll take that step too. Okay, um, so that takes care of uh, actual active uh, technical work at the moment. Um, so this is a, a slot in the agenda where uh, the co-chairs would like to uh, walk down each of the other documents um, that have uh, milestones um, in, our, uh, in our charter and, and on our milestone list and on the, the data tracker and give a quick discussion about uh, each of the authors of these documents was asked to come up to the mic one at a time and just take a couple of minutes to give their version of uh, two minutes of what's the next step on their document. So what we want to do uh, as, as the chairs um, is we are looking to make sure that the milestones are still listed in the order that are interesting here. So this is your opportunity to hear about these documents, make sure that you see what's coming, they are listed here in the order in which they are milestones. Um, probably would have been helpful to pull the dates forward onto this slide, I suppose, to remind people what they are on the milestone list. Um, but I think we want to make this a regular part of our agenda here as a better way to track our work, make it visible to people that these documents are there uh, and, and what their status is. Um, so uh, we're just going to step through these documents one at a time, give everybody a chance to say what they want to say about the documents. We'll take a couple of questions if anybody has anything um, about any one of the documents. If, uh, if, In particular, if you want to speak to saying that a document should move up in the priority list, you'd like to see a reordering of these documents and a reordering of the work, we'd like to hear that. Recall from Chicago, we actually did a review of all of our milestones. We made a presentation then. Um, we had built up, the co-chairs had built up um, in working in the background with document authors, um, the milestone list. We made a presentation to the working group, which was generally agreed. There was consensus about that list, but we want to allow for a re-examination of that at, at each one of these meetings to make sure that we stay on track and that we, everyone gets the priority that they want uh, for these documents. So I apologize for going on a little bit long there. Questions to the group. If listen to the document status. Um, if you have any questions about the document, please stand up and ask. And consider if you want to reorder this list, okay? Because we're going to be going through these documents in this order as we progress the open ones that we have. That's the intent. Any questions about that process and what we're doing here? Okay, then we'll just step right up to the first one, which is the change pull document. <coughs>
Yes, yeah, so for the change poll, the latest revision was to change the authorship. Uh, Sharon had left New Star, so Cal uh, volunteered to take over authorship uh, on behalf of New Star for this particular uh, draft. Uh, and the latest revision as well added the implementation status information uh, for VeriSign and Cal intent. Where's Cal? There we are. All right. Uh, Cal is going to add the implementation status uh, for New Star to the draft as well. Um, and as far as this particular extension is concerned, this is completely generic. Um, I highly encourage the registries to review this and consider this for any server side changes that are occurring. And I encourage the registrars uh, to uh, express the value of this extension because I know that this was built for the registrars to be able to more easily reconcile things that are occurring in the registries. So the more this is used, the easier it will be for registrars to be able to uh, be proactively notified of changes occurring to their objects. So, um, uh, the, and, the, and one, one use of this particular extension that we're considering doing, I know there was a discussion at a prior conference, was a deletion of unused objects. Um, and for the registries out there that have a lot of unused objects, and if you're looking to purge them, um, notification of a deletion of an unused object would be a perfect use case for uh, this particular extension. So, um, okay. Would it be fair to, well, let's uh, get discussion first. Yes, Roger. Um, and I'd like to uh, promote Jim's suggestion of registries looking at this. As a registrar, we would love to see registries implement this. Um, we, we would, We've been pushing this for quite a while, and I thank Jim for putting this on the list to get done. Um, but yes, we, we definitely look forward to this being completed. So hurry up. <laughs> so my question to you is, would it be fair to say that from your point of view, this document's relatively stable, and unless comments or questions come up here, um, it should be expected to move along fairly quickly? Uh, yes, that's correct. I, I see it as stable. Um, and we, in our multiple instances of using this extension, have not seen an issue with it. Um, so that's why a review and feedback from the other registries would be highly valuable. But again, I, I see it as uh, stable at this point. Okay. So, and can I suggest yes. that Jim, uh, Roger, can I suggest that Jim hold an interim meeting so we can move this forward quickly? <laughs> We'll come back to that. Okay, yeah, next yeah. one is allocation token, um, and you get to uh, keep okay. the floor. Uh, yeah, so allocation token, again, this is a collaboration between VeriSign and Newstar. Um, mm -hmm. This has, is a very, very simple extension, exceedingly simple. Um, but the whole idea here is the fact that it can be used for many different use cases. Um, the most recent updates were, again, changing the authorship. Uh, Cal, again, volunteered to take uh, co-authorship of this and uh, we added in the implementation status section and Cal will go ahead and update it with new stars and actually new star is farther ahead on production use of this particular extension uh, but its original intent was to be able to support uh, auctioning off of domain names uh, by third parties and, and allow for the allocation to be passed through from the registrar that could be compared on the registry to authorize the allocation of a domain name. Um, but there are so many other use cases that we've seen for this. So to answer your next question, which is it is absolutely stable. Um, it's as simple as you can get. Um, just passing a string, a token across from the registrar to the registry. But where the complexity comes in is what is the form of the token? You can have many different use cases on this. It could be a, a string, it could be an encoded uh, block of XML. It could be just about anything. The point is that you need to be able to pass this information from the registrar to the registry to be able to allocate a domain. Okay. Thank you. Any comments or questions from anyone? Watson from uh, affiliates. Would it work for the name that need to be claimed from the uh, clearing house? For the trademark clearing house? It's actually very similar to uh, the use of the sign mark 
Um, but the clearinghouse requirement is you have to show that token, well, you have to show that uh, whatever they return from the clearinghouse to the registrar. Right, right. that is a token. Um, it has a different purpose, though, um, because in the case of, like, for example, the launch phase extension that's being used as a precondition to be able to register a name, uh, in the case of the allocation token, it may be something that um, is being uh, that exists that needs to be allocated based on the use of this uh, token. There have been use cases where this extension has been used uh, where a registry operator would pre-authorize the registration of domain name and then have that pass through the channel uh, to authorize the registration. So there has a little bit of overlap, um, but I'm not sure if it would be an exact match to meeting the needs of the TMCH. Okay, we're looking to it. Any other questions or comments? No? Well, then thank you, James. Next up on the list is the DNS operator and Matt Pounceset. Uh, hi. So um, a few months ago, we thought we were pretty close to being done on this, but a few new things have, uh, have come up. So we've got a, a, some, a few small changes that are, are going to be going into the draft. Um, Jacques Latour ran a panel at the last ICANN meeting on policy impacts of CDS and CDNS key records. Um, and there, there are a few outcomes from that that are uh, relevant, although they might not have a huge impact on the draft itself. Um, generally comments that the uh, uh, policies need to be reviewed to, to make sure that third-party DNS operators are recognized um, in, in the registration ecosystem. Um, and uh, and just a general lack of uh, clear model for DNSSEC, DNSSEC information moving around between all parties. Um, one thing that did come out of this that's sort of important, though, is the um, the common wisdom about the limitations of of who can who can accept um, uh, or use uh, CDS and CDNS key, or who who can accept CD or DS and <laughs> DNS key records from registrants. Um, the, the common wisdom is this is essentially can only be done by the, the registrars, but there was a bit of research done into the contracts, um, and it shows that uh, the what it says about registries is they will accept DNS key, DNSSEC material according to industry practices, but not from whom. And uh, <laughs> the the registrars contracts say that they will relay um, DNSSEC material according to industry practice, but it, it doesn't make it their exclusive responsibility. So um, this doesn't have a huge impact on what's in the draft, but it does change who can implement uh, very significantly. Um, uh, of course, if registries are going to do this, there needs to be a way to push data back down to registrars because it's important for them to be able to see what, uh, what their registrants have in, um, in, in their delegations. Um, so uh, we're, uh, I think we're interested in seeing any comments on list if anyone has any uh, definitive information to the contrary. Uh, about this, um, or or general comments about, uh, um, you know, what, how this might change the way things work in the draft. Um, so uh, we had some comments from uh, Mark Elkins uh, suggesting that we adopt some of the things that were uh, used by ISC in bootstrapping DNS in their DLV system. Um, one thing that looks particularly useful there uh, would be inserting a record in the registries zone uh, that indicates the entry point for the uh, for an API. Um, if uh, if if registries are going to implement this, would help with with scalability a lot. Um, so we're considering different options there. Uh, something that looks particularly promising to me is SRV, but of course we'd need a new protocol name for that. Um, so we have uh, four known implementations at the moment. Um, uh, Sira has one running as a registry. Uh, Gandhi is registrar. Uh, APNIC is currently using this for reverse zones. And uh, there's a new implementation in CZNIC's FRED uh, registry, uh, which uh, implements both daily CDS and CDNS key scanning, as well as this protocol for, for registries that don't want to uh, do active scans on, on all zones all the time. Uh, so our current plans are to uh, produce a new uh, version of the draft. Uh, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, uh, once we sort of sort out among ourselves how the how these new changes affect things, um, and we're hoping really for more comments on the draft. 
Uh, Antoine uh, made some great comments uh, that we need to incorporate. Um, but if anyone has any uh, further comments related to what he had to say or anything of, of their own, we'd, we'd really like to hear it. This is Jim Gold from Verison. Um, in re-reviewing the draft recently, I, I recommend adding a, some type of flow at the top related to authentication, authorization, mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't clear. You know, I looked at it, and I was like, I thought that it was something where uh, the registries were going to start pulling information out of DNS, but then the, the rest will calls to be able to go ahead and initiate actions. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming it's on the registry side. I'm not sure, or the registrar. Uh, so I'm not seeing that. I'm not. Uh, it's, maybe I'm, I haven't reviewed it in enough detail. Okay. Well, to we see all those things we, come together. We might be able to make that clearer. the The intention was that um, the protocol could be implemented at the registry or the registrar. Um, we we have a section in the the most recent version about. Um, uh, I think we've we we chose a, a distinct phrase to refer. I think it was registration agent. To uh, and which we defined as being either the registry or the registrar, whoever it is who has the closest business relationship, which with the, the registrant, um, and uh, and sort of indicate that 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 that's the place where where this is intended to be implemented, um, and that if that's the registrar, that they would they would be doing all this work and then passing information, for example, through EPP up up to the registry. Uh, so, we, but we can probably put something in there to make the workflow a little a little clearer. Great, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, Galvin, let me insert myself into the queue um, while I'm sitting here, uh, but not wearing a hat. So, Jim Galvin from Aquilius. I, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, you folks had done the uh, detailed analysis of, of contracts and determining, you know, who is allowed to do something and who's not. And from a technical point of view, you know, all of that is true, and, and I agree with all of that. Um, I just, since I've been the one who's been pressing on this a lot with, with, with you folks, uh, not you specifically, but but Oliver and Jock and others, um, I just feel compelled to continue to, uh, to to go on record and point out that part of industry best practices is the relationship that registrars and registries have with each other. Um, of course, there is a question of documentation on all of this, but in principle, the standing industry best practice is registries don't tell registrars what their data should be. Registrars own the data. So the idea that a registry would take in these DS records and this key information and then push it back to the registrar is, you know, not a foregone conclusion. Um, and I don't know if, 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 you know, any registrars in the room want to stand up and speak to this in particular, but, you know, I mean, my experience with registrars is no, they're not interested in that, at least on the GTLD side. But if we could change that, that'd be fine. Yeah, and, and as an occasional third-party operator and, and an end user who likes to manage his own data, uh, I'm, you know, I'm perfectly happy with an, anybody to implement this. Um, uh, it, it, we, we specifically designed it so it, doesn't, it, it can be implemented sort of at any level of the, uh, of the registration. Yeah. And, and as an individual, I mean, I, I think it's great protocol. I certainly don't have any issues with it, and I, I think it's, you know, it's a fine piece of work. Um, but I am very concerned about the policy side of it. So if, mm -hmm. I, if I wear my yeah. registry service provider hat, I, I just have to, to stand on that particular principle. But yeah, anyway. yeah, this isn't a thing we intend to uh, incorporate into the draft, um, but it does. But it is. Um, we're, we're concerned. We are also concerned about the policy implications. So we've been trying to get the community to discuss that and and see what shakes out. Right. Yeah. Not this community. The ICANN community. <laughs> the, right. Well, the yes, yeah, the the, I, the community in general. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, this is Jody from GoDaddy, just speaking as a registrar. Yeah, we're, we're not comfortable as a registrar having the data changed underneath mm -hmm. without the registrar being in the loop first. Yeah. Um, that's always been a concern of ours, just stating it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the, the trailing question, since no one else is getting up to the mic, obviously over, over to you guys is, uh, I guess at this point you're still doing work and you're still working the document, so uh, you don't have any immediate plans to suggest that it's it's stable and ready to move forward. Uh, no, but no, we we definitely have at least one more version uh, to go um, and and see where com comments are after that. Okay, yeah. sounds good. All right, thank you.
And uh, next up is the bundling uh, registration document. Um, <coughs> yes, please come up to the pink box. Uh, my name is Jian Kang Yao. Uh, so I introduced uh, bundling registration. Uh, in, I think in this whole meeting, I'm not sure. Uh, there, the, currently, there are, according to the WD uh, discussion, there are three uh, bundling. Uh, first is strict, strict bundling. Uh, second is partial bundling. Third is relaxed bundling. Uh, the current uh, document is most focused on strict bundling. This bundling is require most uh, the registrants share the same uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of the attributes. So currently we have DAO uh, HK, DAO CN, and DAO Zhongguo, and DAO MO, DAO SG, and DAO TW. Uh, so a lot of, also a lot of Chinese uh, 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 Ch Chinese TLD use this bundling uh, registration uh, uh, system. So we ha already have uh, uh, a lot of uh, experience uh, in so meeting. We may we have uh, uh, some some pro proposal. We have uh, merged also also uh, partial uh, uh, pass partial bundling and uh, strict bundling and uh, relaxed bundling together with uh, one uniform solution. But uh, after several months of discussion, we cannot easily uh, get the uniform solution. So I think uh, the kind of best way to do. Uh, push forward is uh, use the uh, uh, first is uh, uh, strict bundling and another is partial bundling and the third is uh, uh, relaxed bundling. So since uh, uh, this draft, uh, the the method is already matured. So I uh, we like to push for uh, forward. Thank you. Um, okay, so just a. Uh quick comment on the, on the history of this document just to remind the working group with <clears throat> when this document was originally brought forward um, we actually I guess it was two IETF meetings ago so I guess it was Seoul we had the BOTH on uh, DNS bundling um, and we had decided in this working group we put this document on hold at the time pending what would happen in that particular working group with DNS bundling um, so there was an opportunity there for all bundling parts to go into a separate working group um, so that, uh, we, we had that BOF, but uh, there, there was no follow-on proposal for a working group. So now we're just putting this document, we're taking this document off of a hold status, if you will, kind of our own internal <coughs> designation and putting it on the list. It is at the end of our milestone list at the moment, so it's not something which is going to come up here in, in the near term. Um, but I think I just heard you also say that you're actually ready to move this forward into making it a work item. Um, so should I interpret from that that you would like to see it reordered in the milestone list to come closer towards the top? Uh, I think Karna would be okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, all right. So it's still a, a future work item for the moment. Go ahead, Ning. You want to say something different? Ning from Cynic. Uh, I think uh, because the draft uh, we think is a mutual, so uh, if possible, we, we would like to uh, move move uh, forward. Yes. Seven yeah. The other, remove the the other is okay. So in front of okay, um, in front of everything that's there, or or you just want to see it move up. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to be specific here for what the uh, ask move, is. Move up group. is okay for me. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments about this document or changing its priority? Then, Alex? So the question from Alex is, is this important just to CNNIC or is it important to anyone else, this particular document uh, and proposal? Can you, yeah, come to the microphone, please? It's Jack from uh, Teleinfo. 
we have implemented this draft uh, in our SRS system and uh, our, our charity is Chinese dot uh, Xinxi uh, in English is information so till now uh, this uh, uh, we have implemented this draft for nearly one years it uh, works well in our system thank you so a quick question I don't actually recall offhand. Is there an implement sta implementation status section in, in the document today? Uh, no, no, no special saying about implementation status, but uh, uh, in .hk, .sg, and .tw, uh, .mo uh, all implement this uh, uh, mechanism. So we also have a, a CDNC table. We have a, um, uh, maintain the table for more than one, uh, ten, 10 years. So I think for uh, especially used for Chinese uh, uh, domain names. So I, I, I think it is okay for us. A, a lot of Chinese domain uh, TLDs, also a lot of Chinese domain names under the second tier and under and the, the ASCII TLD. So I think uh, at least one action that should come out of this is uh, to um, collect, implement, put a particular question on the mailing list. You should ask on the mailing list, or if you know the answer, you can you can just create it. But ask for implementation status and gather that up and create that section in the document okay. and, and collect that so that we have that data. Um, but James, go ahead, please. Hey, this is Jim Gould from VeriSign. So just to clarify, there are three forms of bundles. Uh, one was association. So we're going to go object-oriented here. So association was pretty much client-specified relationships. Uh, the next level was aggregation, where there are separate actual instances that may share some, by policy, some attributes, specifically the sponsorship. So there's separate life cycles and that sort of thing. Um, and then the last form is composite, which is what I believe this draft matches, where it's a share all kind of scenario uh, with enablement and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to point out at least, and the reason I got, came up here is that uh, we have a proprietary uh, extension called the related domain extension that supports the association and the aggregation. And uh, we really would not have a need for the composite one of this draft. Uh, Ning from Cynic, uh, based on the RFC 3743, and uh, the Chinese domain name, uh, <clears throat> if one register uh, your preferred Chinese domain name, and based on the the Chinese domain name variant table, and the registry, we will then also send you the simplified domain names and also the traditional version of domain name. So that means uh, all the registries who sell who sell the Chinese domain names most most uh, registries uh, based on the RFC three seven four three and the uh, domain name register registered can get not only one domain names uh, he will get <coughs> a bundle of domain names. Thank you. Question from the Jabber room, because um, Antoine is having mic trouble. He says, since strict bundling is not a uniform solution, should it be a standards track document or informational? So we, we try to be a standard track. Uh, so may uh, uh, drop the standard track. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think at the moment then, the, the right action um, we do need to uh, make a decision about uh, how and, and when to uh, change the milestones. I think what I'd like to propose is that we take that to the mailing list, that question, so that we can allow some other discussion. I'm, I'm going to presume uh, right up front that most people probably don't have that close a look at the milestone list. So um, we'll construct a question for the mailing list. The chairs will construct a question for the mailing list with uh, the dates on the current milestones that are there. Um, and give us, a, so the working group has all that information right in front of them, and then ask explicitly the question of whether folks want to move this up or what they want to do next after the documents that are in progress. 
okay? We're not going to take on the work item anyway until we discharge a couple of the open ones. So we have a little bit of time here to discuss whether it should be next on the list. Make sense? Okay, that's it then. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So next up is the uh, validate draft. Back over to Roger. I believe this is actually the last one, right? Oh, I, you know, I, I should actually offer, um, just as a, as a point of clarification, this is an interesting oversight that has carried forward from when this was the EPP extensions working group, because this document actually has its origins as part of the original chartering of EPP extensions and coming forward. And what's interesting is um, in preparation for this meeting, um, your, your co-chairs discovered uh, an interesting gap in doing an audit on the milestones. And that is that while this is a, um, uh, an accepted and adopted document on the list, there actually is no milestone for it. The milestone is, is currently missing, which is kind of interesting. Um, I have actually spoken to our uh, area director about this, so he's, he's aware of this. And in, and in recognition of the fact that this, this actually did come with us, from way back in EPP extensions, um, we're going to submit a, a milestone um, for this, and, and he will approve that and allow it to get on the list so that it's, it's part of what we're dealing with. Um, and uh, uh, we have not actually decided exactly where in the list this will go. Right now, it's at the end and at the bottom, um, and, and we'll have to figure out uh, exactly where we think it ought to go. So if you have any advice about that, we'll sort of take that question to the mailing list, but we can, we can make all of that happen in the our area director is ready for that. Okay. Um, and I'm betting that no one actually noticed that, right? Anyone here actually noticed that besides us somewhere along the way? But anyway, interesting. So Roger, over to you. Okay, the validate is uh, a mapping to validate contacts into a registry pre-transformation command so that you can get a valid set of contacts, be it one for whatever is needed for the registry to be validated before you actually issue the create command that will end up failing because you, you can create a completely valid contact at a registry, but you can't use it as a registrant or you can't use it as an admin specifically. So they'll allow the contact create to happen and they'll fail the create domain. Um, so this actually tests that prior to a uh, create so that you can actually get a valid uh, set of contacts going in. Um, this document is fairly simple, straightforward. Uh, I think it's only seven pages with title and index, everything. So it's 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 a quick read. Uh, status is it's 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 done. Uh, it's been through several comment periods, not comment periods, but several iterations. Um, and uh, right now, it just sets in waiting for uh, to get bumped up. Okay. Any quick comments or discussion from? Uh Anyone? Okay, so you consider the document stable and uh, ready to go forward and, and pending any other, any issues that might surface, um, you're ready for it to uh, move up on the list. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that takes us through that and uh, moves us um, onto the RDAP uh, object tag. Um, in, in this case, I, I don't think I was looking for, for Scott to say anything here. It's really just a reminder, and I think you've probably at this point you know, heard everything we're saying about um, uh, adoption. Having talked to our area director, uh, folks will remember from the uh, Chicago meeting um, that when this document came up and it was presented there and we talked about it, although there seemed to be in the room at the time some consensus to adopt this document, the uh, area director had pushed back and had asked instead that we really have to get our, our long list of milestones under control. So one of the things that has happened, as, as you know, is we have actually trimmed the set of milestones. So now it's because we actually dropped a couple of documents off along the way here um, when they've been reordered. Um, and so, and we have actually submitted the launch phase, but it hasn't moved forward onto the ISGQ. Uh, the feed document is just about ready to go too, so we'll, we'll get past that. Um, but the explicit guidance from our area director is let's move along the work in progress, a couple of items that are work in progress, and as soon as those are actually on the ISG agenda and they're actually in the publication cycle itself, 
um, then we can come back and adopt this document and add it to our list and you know pick up some of the other milestones and move it along. So um, it has to remain pending until we close on some of the other items that are there. And that's just a procedural point more than anything. Any comments or questions about that? Scott, please. Oh, and where'd the microphone go? Very short person. <laughs> Okay, um, so just one thought there. I, I, we know fairly well that within a few months, we're going to start seeing RDAP implementation in pilot phases among GTLD registries. Um, for, for those of us who are in the room and who care about this, I'd really like you to take a look at this draft. If you are going to be implementing support for contacts in RDAP, this document describes an operational practice for how to tag them in a way that's consistent with existing practice that's being uh, done by the RIRs today. It will help with the bootstrapping of contact queries if you think that that's a problem, right? And if you do take a look at it, if you start you know, to implement uh, RDAP in a pilot and you think this is helpful, please let me know. I would like to keep the document alive and active in terms of adding implementation status information. All right? And indeed, once this finally does get adopted, there's not a lot here in terms of controversy or it's not protocol, it's BCP. And so I think once this does get adopted, it should move through the queue very quickly. Good, thank you. Any questions or comments from anyone? Okay, then we're moving towards the end here. Um, so, uh, okay, now Roger, you can, you can get up. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, let me just give a little, a little preamble. Um, we uh, we had the interim meeting last week, and and actually I, I have to say that uh, even from from my point of view, it was really was a very successful meeting. And you know, Rogers already indicated he thought it was successful. Um, you know, certainly interested in in anyone else who was there. If you want to speak up and, and make a comment about it, uh, you know, the format was essentially that um, you know Roger as uh, uh, editor of of the fee extension document. Um, you know, chaired the meeting, moderated the meeting and the discussion, and people who had issues and concerns about the document brought them to the table and we talked about them. And in an hour, we had a very productive meeting um, and really got to a very good place, as, as Roger had reported earlier. Um, and clearly, from the point of view of the success that we had in Chicago in having two sessions, uh, one of which was a working session so that we could actually progress documents um, very directly, um, this really did um, was a nice complement to that opportunity um, and it focused on one single document so unless anyone has any objections to whether or not you know we should do this I, I think that having interim meetings going forward is a good thing um, now this was kind of an experience even for for your co-chairs to learn how to make all of this happen and, and understand all the administrative process that that gets it uh, gets it going we, we think we've got all that under control we have learned one thing along the way that we didn't know before, um, which for this particular meeting, uh, GoDaddy was kind enough to host it as a Zoom meeting. Um, and that, that worked out for all of the participants and no one objected to using that. But it turns out you can ask for me.co. Um, so, you know, we can use the IETF sort of standard for doing these things. So we can actually make a me.co uh, request and then have that set up so that we can use that and everybody can be remote and we can have a meeting. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. It's, it's certainly not a requirement. I mean, Zoom worked out well, and I, I think that, you know, just speaking from the point of view of a chair, whatever technology works for the participants is fine for the interim meeting. Um, it's just useful to know that that option is available to us. Um, we did not try and have two meetings at this particular meeting uh, for, you know, mostly just, uh, you know, time constraints. Part of it is, is the availability of your, your, your co-chairs in making that happen. Um, uh, so, uh, but there is the, an open question here for the working group as to whether, you know, if these I, inter meetings are so effective, you know, do we really need to plan for two meeting requests? The IETF tends to want to discourage that unless you can really justify it. Um, I think we did a good thing last time in, in justifying it. It helped this working group a lot. This working group tends to be a little slow moving, a little hard to keep people engaged um, and, and active. So. Uh, you know, having the two meetings last time really proved that a working session is a good thing. I think the interim meeting proved that uh, we can make effective use of those. Um, 
So we don't have to answer the last question here about whether there's a demand for a work session now at the next meeting. But you know what we really should be thinking in terms of is for these documents that we currently are trying to close on, you know, the way to make the closure happen uh, is to have an inter meeting and, and to do this again. And uh, you know, as co-chair, as a one of the chairs, I would just appeal to the document editors to ask for that and explicitly ask on the list and make that happen. The only real thing that you have to do is is ask on the list if there's interest in having a meeting. And as long as we know at least two weeks in advance so that at least one week in advance we can submit all the formal documentation to the IETF for it um, and get it listed in the in the data tracker as a meeting that occurred then it can happen so you really just need to drive it if you're a document editor you want to move along a document you, you really can just drive this just you know make sure that your your chairs are informed and tracking with you because we'll do the administrative side of uh, working with the secretariat to, to get everything together and, and happen but this is an opportunity for open discussion. People have an opinion about inter-meetings, not having them. Uh, Roger, do you want to say anything more about uh, you started to say before? I'll give you a chance that you ran this meeting and pushed on it and set it up. Uh, yeah, this is Roger. Um, I, I'm not sure I have anything much more to say than what I said. I, it was very useful. We had eight or nine people attend. Um, and, and as Jim mentioned, we, we worked through some pretty good items, a, a, actually at a pretty quick pace. And that's why I would still suggest trying to get a face-to-face -face meeting here. I, that, that virtual meeting was nice because we were sort of face-to-face. -face, um, and it seems to work better than emailing and waiting for someone to respond. It, the, the list works for, I think, certain things. But I think the, the, the interim meeting or the face-to-face -face here uh, allows for uh, more in-depth discussions to occur. So, thank you for that. So, just my takeaway from from that is is uh, you want to leave open the question of a second work session at, at the next meeting. Um, let's not lose track of that, but definitely promoting interim meetings and doing it again. So, document authors, keep that in mind. So we can move things along. Okay. Any other discussion or comments from anyone about uh, interim meetings? Okay, not seeing anyone in the meet echo queue. I guess there's nothing in, in the Jabber, so. All right, so that actually brings us to the end of our agenda. This is the opportunity we get to say any other business. And we got people lining up at the queue, wow. <laughs> Almost scary how quickly people stood up. No, this Scott, is a good please thing. go ahead. Scott Hollenbeck, this is a good thing. We've got other things to talk about. Uh, okay, so those of you who were at the meeting in Chicago or saw the, meet, uh, the meeting minutes may recall that uh, I had asked a question about an individual submission internet draft that was written by myself and two of my colleagues. Uh, it describes a method for doing search in RDAP using regular expressions. One of the, bit of feed, one of the bits of feedback we got was, uh, no, don't do base64 URL encoding. You can just use standard URL encoding. And indeed, we investigated that, found out that it works just fine. So the document was updated to reflect that change. However, one of the other things I took away from that meeting when I asked for who might be actually interested in using this, pursuing it, or whatever, uh, there was absolutely no response at all. So I don't want to work on something that people have no interest in. And so I just wanted to ask one more time before we kind of let this one die. Is anyone interested in seeing that particular document move forward? Okay. I am seeing one hand up. Yeah. And I would certainly suggest, you know, putting that on the mailing list, obviously. I think you would do that anyway, but just yep. call it out. Okay. Thank you. Dmitry Belovsky, Technical Center of Internet. If anybody is interested in using uh, email address internationalized in UPP, uh, I am uh, I, I will be glad to discuss it. Thank you. So I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. I know what e email address in, in what? E email address in internationals, EAI. Oh, in EAI. Uh, oh, okay. uh, with non ASCII left part. So. Uh, I would like to discuss it if anybody is interested. Thank you. Okay. I am Mario Lofredo from uh, register.it. I would like to present uh, in a couple of minutes an idea about to improve interoperability between uh, uh, RDAP clients and server. And I would like to know if, uh, in your opinion, it's worth to be developed and presented in a draft. Uh, the idea is based on the JSON schema concept. 
the Jesus schema is uh, uh, is described in a free internet draft of uh, Jason B's uh, working group, uh, and uh, uh, it, it defines uh, a media, uh, the media type uh, application slash schema plus JSON, a JSON-based format for describing the structure of JSON data. It asserts what a JSON document must look like, the ways to extract information from it, and how to interact with, uh, with it. Uh, this uh, uh, idea is, uh, was born uh, from the fact that uh, uh, currently uh, the uh, ADAP uh, APIs are not uh, self-descriptive, uh, and this is uh, th there is a consensus uh, on the web uh, on the fact that uh, a modern uh, REST uh, APIs should be self-descriptive. And uh, uh, currently in 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 ADAP there is uh, no way for the server to provide the formal description of its feature. The, the, there is the help and the point, but uh, uh, it returns uh, a human readable but not uh, machine processable uh, information. And such, in, such information can be heterogeneous. The server cannot provide formal information about uh, which uh, ADAP query capabilities implement and which subset of the standard response or, or which response extensions it returns. So the client cannot configure itself. Uh, according to the server feature and as a consequence the, the user can waste time to submitting uh, to submit requests that cannot be accepted because they are not uh, implemented at all or, or, or because uh, they are not allowed according to the user access level the client must know the feature of all the servers in, it interacts with if a server changes its feature, this causes an additional implementation effort by the client implementers. Uh, so can I, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. I did, I want to ask one question though. Did you have a, are you presenting this for information to this working group or did you have an ask of this working group with respect to this? I would like to know if uh, this uh, idea is, it's worth to be developed, it's worth to be presented in a draft or, it's a waste of time to to go on on this idea. Okay, all right. So I apologize for interrupting you, sir. Yes, let me sir. let you finish. Oh, yes. Are you done? Okay. Um, do we have comments or questions on that as opposed to a new item? I think the guy behind you there wants to step up and comment. So this is Andy and Aaron. Um, so I have a draft that may have expired already uh, on describing the RDAP data structures in JCR, not JSON schema. Um, and uh, I'll note that both JCR and JSON schema are not standards or IETF. There are IETF drafts for both of them, but the IETF is on nowhere with, with both. Um, the, uh, uh, so as far as trying to put the JSON, uh, the JSON that RDAP uses into a more formal structure or a more formal uh, schema definition, I think is an interesting idea, obviously, since I wrote a draft about it. The, uh, um, uh, I do have a problem with the issue of clients somehow understanding either JCR or JSON schema and then adapting their behavior. That, I mean, that, that idea has been around for a long time. The people who did SOAP and those type of things, that's one of the things they sold us on. Um, it, uh, I don't think that's a, a, a good path to go down. So when we're talking about interoperability, yes, I think it's a good idea to have a more formal, formal definition of what those structures are. But if we're doing that because we think clients are going to somehow change their behavior, I think that's a, a, a false expectation. So uh, I do want to point out that RDAP currently does have the RDAP conformance structure in the very top of the response which says, here's what these servers are, uh, do support, so. Before you sit down, a, a question for you to respond to. Um, is there, a, do you think this is an appropriate form for this discussion or would you suggest that it should be visited somewhere else? Um, <coughs> I hope we're talking about specifically about RDAP and not JSON schemas. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, this is probably the, the appropriate form. Uh, if if uh, there are interoperability issues with RDAP, people writing clients and servers, then yeah, th this is probably the place to do it. Uh, and if we want to go down this path of trying to write a more formalized schema around it, yeah, this, this would be the place to do it. 
uh, I don't know what what I don't know is how many other people are interested in it. You have two so far, right? So, so let me ask that question. Anyone else want to express interest in the topic or have an opinion at this point about it? Because I, I think, well, Scott, please go ahead. Uh, Scott Hollenbeck. I'm surely interested in it. Um, I mean, I see some value to it. Both Andy and Mario are saying. Um, and Andy, you might just have been a little bit ahead of the curve initially, but I do think it's interesting now that we've had two people independently, you know, kind of come up with the same idea here. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to uh, just reject this out of hand. I think it's something that is worth discussing. Um, so yeah, back in into the spirit of the purpose of this working group, in in you know, again, two roles. One is also an opportunity for you know people to bring interesting topics and ideas to to an appropriate set of experts. Um, let me suggest, Mario, that actually you should write an internet draft. Um, it can be, you know, an individual submission for right now, and then make it visible to this working group and ask for comments. And then similarly, I'll look back to Andy. Check on the status of your document and resurrect it if necessary. And also, uh, you know, when the two of these come out together, make them both visible together. Um, and then the working group we can reconsider. I mean, if, if you guys both want. Um, I'm sure we can make time in our agenda probably at our next meeting and give you an opportunity to, to talk about the, the two documents and we can see what discussion comes from it. Yeah, so I think the challenge is going to be, um, I think the, the challenge in trying to say we need a formal data definition language to use is finding that right thing to do. Um, like I said, neither JCR or JSON schema are, are internet standards and so uh, um, you're, you're going to have to Cross that bridge when you get to it. Um, so, I, I think the, the the first question ought to be, do we need this? And then the second question is going to be the harder one, which is, uh, what do we do then? Right. All right. Thank you for that. So we'll we'll make that the primary. The, the do we need this as kind of the primary question that we would examine at, at our next meeting if we if we take the presentations, put them up there. Okay. Next topic. Right, um, Chris from Core Association. Uh, I want to bring us back a little bit uh, again into the beginning and into the fees extension. And mm -hmm. I have a general comment, which I think is more appropriate now than uh, when we were discussing the specifics. And that is, I have noticed that many of the registries have quite a few differences in the way that they implement the fees extension. And especially because, of course, we also have multiple versions of it then we end up with essentially more or less every registry implementing as if they're implementing a separate extension. And a lot of the time, it doesn't make sense. Some registries, for example, they, they don't even have a currency. They just put XXX instead of the currency and they expect you to send XXX. Um, I don't know what we can do or if anything, or if we should just, uh, the registrars should bother the registries to actually comply with the extension or if I don't, I don't know what can be done to ensure that the adoption of this extension is uniform between the registries in the same way because otherwise does it actually make sense to to have this in, in this way I mean just something that we should consider so I'll, I'll offer two comments uh, you know on the one hand one of the reasons for the extension is because there are different implementations of the way people do it so you know, um, and those of us who are here are trying to pay attention to that, and that's a good thing. And the other thing is, you're right, currently, even those who have implemented this extension, because it's gone through a couple of iterations, we are at different places um, in that cycle. Um, but I fully expect that for those of us who have implemented it, and, you know, speaking partly for myself, but I'm, I'm fairly certain I'm not speaking out of turn by suggesting that even VeriSign plans to uh, implement the latest stable version once we, uh, we get to that point. They'll certainly upgrade and and be in that place. Um, you know, protocol adoption in general in the IETF, uh, I can make the standard kind of response to that. Um, you know, people do things because they're good and they work for them, right? There's there's no enforcement mechanism for IETF standards. But hopefully we have, you know, the significant people here and people will see the value and, and they'll want to adopt it. So I, you know, I, I, I don't think we can take on the responsibility of promoting adoption although that's kind of implicit in having the right people in the room who are developing the standard. But anyway, James, over to you. Uh, yes, Jim Gould from uh, VeriSign. I was going to comment on this one that I had a separate topic, but um, I would say it's better to have these drafts, otherwise they're going to have a bunch of custom extensions that the registries will implement in five different ways. 
so that's a positive. But I do agree with you that uh, there are complexities uh, with the registries following what the intent of the draft is. So, um, and even implementing the version that we implemented, which was the 06 prior to the working group taking it, um, we had saw, saw some issues in that and we had to make decisions on our own to get it to work. And that's what fed in with some of the feedback. I'm not sure how you can ensure it. That's, I, I guess there's not a... Yeah. No, Scott Hollenbeck, and no, internet police hat off. Uh, but actually, there is something we can do. Move the document forward. Get it published as an RFC. And then implementers drive towards implementing the RFC. Yeah, good point. Thank you for that. Very important. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. And I mean, in, in general, we're all gathering here, or a lot of us might be gathering at the ICANN meetings. We should take that opportunity to kind of bring this up and, and push for it for people to, to take it to where it actually is now and not where it was a year ago. Thank you. This Roger, and, and yeah, I mean, when we finalize this draft, we will be suggesting to our partners uh, to implement the current draft. Um, we do not want to support multiple versions of this draft. Uh, for some time, I, I'm sure we will have a few versions that we run, but we will be getting rid of those. So um, we, we will be suggesting uh, for our partners to move forward on this. And in the ICANN world, uh, there is a tech ops group that's part of uh, the registrar stakeholders group, and they brought this topic up independent a month or so ago uh, about fees. Um, and they didn't even know that this was being worked. Some of them did not know this was being worked here. So we have pushed back to that group that this is in the works and it's close to being done. So from the registrar standpoint, it is being evangelized through the ICANN world as well. Great. Thank you. Any other comments on the fee extension? Yeah, one more. Uh, Jody Calker, go to Eddie. All I'm going to do is put in a plug for Tech Ops, join the group, join the discussion, and that's how we can push it forward. Well, so it is an open list. Anybody can join. Be speaking to the mic, please. <laughs> That's a good question. I'm pretty sure registrars can join. It's a it's a group from the registrar stakeholders group. So I, I'm sure that any registrar can join, but I'd have to look at that to make sure. Yeah, and so let me suggest, if you wouldn't mind, you know, explicitly, you know, figure that out and and send a note to the mailing list and and make it visible to everyone who's on the list. Whatever constraints are there, you know, say that too. But I'll point out how to subscribe and such and about the list. Good point. Okay, new topic. Back to James. Uh, yeah, this was brought up at the last ITF and is around file formats, um, specifically around the data escrow uh, drafts that are out there that are being implemented by a lot of folks, um, and by pretty much the, this group. Um, the other is the, the bulk uh, file format uh, draft that I've created. I have not proposed to bring that forward yet, um, but my hope is that uh, once we hit, get experience with it to then bring it forward. I guess the question was, I could not remember where we left it on the file format drafts um, and whether or not that's in scope or out of scope for this working group. Well, un unfortunately, um, part of what happened in that is I will admit to having dropped the ball on one particular key issue, um, and that is we had a transition of area directors in, in March, and, and in that transition, Although I had on my list of things to talk to our prior area director about it, um, I had not talked to our new area director about the fact that those documents, this is probably the best place for those documents to exist. They're not really strictly EPP or, or RDAP. So, you know, we need to have that negotiation with our area director and, and uh, you know, obviously the ISG has to weigh in on, on whether they think something belongs in this group or not in that sense, because they're strictly speaking a little out of scope, but on the other hand, kind of in scope for the concept of what we're doing here. Um, so does I guess that make sense? The question is, what's the next step? So we have yeah. these drafts out there. I think the data escrow one's been out there for years, and it's been implemented by many people. Um, the, the goal from the authors is to move those forward, yeah. and we're trying to find a place for those to go. So there's two next steps. Uh, one is, um, uh, now, thank you for, for raising that again. Um, I need to have a discussion with, with Adam here. Uh, about the, where these documents fit and tell him what, what they are and what's going on and, and see what he wants to do about that. But on the, on the assumption that, so I either, 
either we'll move forward with bringing them into this group, which will then bump up against the can't do anything until other things go out the door, or he will say, okay, he understands, he wants to do something else with them, then he'll take them on board. Um, but I'll have that discussion with him, and then we'll send a note to the list and let everybody know where that's going to go. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. So, Andy Newton, Aaron. So, I just want to I just want to say that I do think this is the right place for that. Um, what he his 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 document, and I read it, uh, talks about is a similar problem to what we commonly see as bulk who is, and there are formats for that as well, which kind of bumps up against the RDAP stuff, right? I think it's a slightly different problem, but I think this is the place to make sure that we don't conflate the two things, right? So. Uh, and, and, you know, having said all of that, and, and since our area director is actually listening here, anyone else want to comment for or against this working group adopting these documents? Hopefully people will remember the documents since we've talked about them in the past. And, and I'm not seeing a lot of nodding heads, but at least a couple of the principals have, have made a comment. Um, so, all right. So, all right. Adam, you want to comment? Our esteemed area director. Uh, Adam Roach. No, what I wanted to bring up was, I mean, probably a two paths forward would be changing the charter and putting it in here, or AD sponsoring it. And what would make the difference between those two is really how many working group participants are likely to actually work on them. Um, if we can get broader review by putting it in here, then I think I'd like to go down that path. If it's just really going to be, you know, the one or two people who are working on it already, uh, we probably can go ahead and 80 sponsor it. I definitely prefer the first if we could get enough interest, though. So I want, I mean, if people just want to, like, raise a hand and say, yes, we'll work on this, that would be helpful. Or you can take that on the list either way. But that would be a useful input to making that decision. Um, so let's do a quick little uh, a hum, I guess, is the, uh, the the way to do this. Uh, people want to hum and, and indicate their, their support for this this document in general and, and moving it forward. So uh, I'll do two hums, one those in, in favor and, and uh, a hum for those opposed. So those in favor? Oh, wait, Roger, did you want to comment? Can, can, can we have a different hum on the document that we're trying to discuss? And it, again, I'd, I'd like to go to the mailing list because I know I've read it. I can't say that I'm familiar with it today. So, Fair enough. Maybe maybe I shouldn't go far. We should do it on the mailing list because we're, we're resurrecting discussions that happened some number of months ago, and not everyone's going to have it in the top of their mind. Uh, can I clarify the request? Yes. The first request is whether or not file format drafts are in scope for this working group. That's number one. And then if there were a hum, it would be under the data escrow drafts, which have been implemented by many, many folks. I'm not sure about in this room, but... Right. There are a couple of file format documents. There's the data escrow stuff and there's the pricing stuff. So there's actually uh, two of those. Um, and then um, there's a separate bulk access document, right? Or that's what you meant by data escrow? That's what you meant? No. So there are three separate things to, to worry about here. Yeah, yeah. There are two drafts for data escrow. And then there's one for bulk file format. Okay. And then GoDaddy had another one for pricing. Yeah, for the file formats for pricing document. Is there a is there another one? No. Uh, unavailable man. Put it this way, it's it's a different classification of work. Yes. Um so whether or not that's in scope or not. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other business? Francisco. Yeah, uh, Francisco Arias, I can. Uh, speaking of uh, reviving uh, drafts, there is a, a draft on the TMCH, uh, the ICANN TMCH specification, uh, the, the interface that was originally, or at some point was in the uh, in the charter and was dropped at some point by uh, oh, yes. lack of priority or something like that. I'm actually not clear on why it was dropped and I was wondering if there is a path, what is the path to reviving this uh, draft? The reason why that document was dropped was because the IDN matching rules um, were um, unacceptable. <laughs> um, and uh, they, uh, there's just inconsistency um, on, the, uh, on the ICANN side about that. So from my point of view, it's, it's, it was Patrick Polstrom, you know Patrick, okay, who was the principal objector. And, you know, there are just so few people who are experts on that space and dealing with this issue. If you go back and you look in the archives and find the messages, Patrick was very clear about his issues. Um, and until those issues are resolved, you know, we really can't move the document forward. 
and I realize that that sounds like we have one person blocking a document, but you know, they're just he's he's an expert. I, if anyone else wants to stand up and be one, you've got to have that discussion with Patrick and, and resolve it. So, so that, that uh, Francisco again. So I think that conversation already happened uh, months ago, and uh, as far as I understand, the issue was uh, clarified. I think it was more of a, a miscommunication uh, between the 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 authors and the and, and Patrick. And my understanding is that issue was uh, solved and, and, and clear. Uh, but then uh, maybe there was some step that was not taken to revive this uh, document in the, in the working group. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I mean, I can only say that from, from my point of view and, and you know, speaking on behalf of Antoine as co-chairs, I mean, we, as far as we know, it was delegated back to, uh, to, to Patrick and, and it's Gustavo, right? Yes. Yeah, to, to resolve. Um, if it has actually been resolved, we were not aware of that. So you just need to bring that information forward onto the mailing list, um, and then then we can take it from there. And and of course now since that document was actually dropped off our milestone list, it now bumps up against the. In order to move it forward, we have to finish what we're doing, and then we get to add it back in and, and make it happen. Okay. So. Thank you, uh, Francisco. And so just just uh, to see if I understand. So next up would be uh, for uh, Gustavo to uh, go to the mailing list and and explain what was the. What was done, and uh, to clarify that this is solved, so that and request uh, adoption of the document. Yeah, Either. I mean, to be a strict point of process thing, I guess he has to he has to send in a revised document with whatever changes came out uh -huh. of that. And um, <coughs> um, I guess it's still a, it was a regex working. I don't think it was left as an individual submission, right? It, it actually had been been renamed, so um, he can revise the document, and so it uh, becomes active again. But he'll have to ask for the working group to uh, to reconsider the issues. He should respond to um, the original note from Patrick about what the issues were, um, and then he'll have to. Even though it's going to be named as a working group, as if it was a working group document, we're still going to have to go through a working group adoption process for it. Just to be fair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I saw Antoine pop up there, although, and I'm wondering, is he trying to type anything in Jabber by any chance, or? Is it comment? Okay. I don't know if the voice works or not. You want to try and speak, Antoine? Is your mic working now? Or I have your comment from the general. I think I'm a bit low on volume, am I? You're, real, you're really quite muffled. It's a little hard to hear you. So, yeah, let Suzanne read it. So, the comment um, from Antoine the TMCH document was also rejected since it's only describing an ICANN process and not a general process. So, it should Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a that's a status question, um, but we can. Yeah, we'll need to to keep that in mind too. Uh, so, did you get that, Francisco? If you want to comment on that and and make that, um, if you want to make a pitch for something different, then uh, Gustavo will need to say that too when he uh, uh, brings the document back up. So, okay. Any other business questions, comments from anyone? Uh, where are the blue sheets? Just hold them up, please. It would be nice if uh, not only would you hold them up so I can see them, if you could bring them to the front of the room here, and I, I'd appreciate that. Um, and I guess uh, I, there should be two of them. I only see one. Where the other one go? Look around you on your floor, folks. Somebody's got it. I don't want them to get lost. Oh, there we go. All right, we got them both. So, all right, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. We're adjourned. Yes, and a special...